Welcome to the F Mind Podcast with me, Stephen Goldstein, and my co-host, Mark Randall. Our guest today is Marston Park. Marston is one of the new market wizards featured in Jack Schrager's new book, Unknown Market Wizards. Before we start this week's episode, a quick word about our podcast partner, the Society of Technical Analysts, the STA. The STA are the world's oldest body serving the trading community for the advancement of technical analysis and price action knowledge and education. They are a not-for-profit community open to members from around the world. The STA offer outstanding publications, talks, webinars and conferences and have partnered with some of the world's leading academic bodies to provide top quality training and education courses, programs and diplomas. As part of our partnership with the STA, listeners of the Alphamon podcast can get a 100 British pounds or local currency equivalent discount on the cost of their superb home study course and diploma program. To find out more about this, visit the home study page at the top of the Alpha Mind blog. You can find that at alphamindblog.blogspot.com or just Google Alpha Mind blog. Also, a quick word about some of the coaching and developmental services we offer to people in the trading and investment world. The Alpha Mind Trader Performance Coaching Program has been delivered to leading traders and investment professionals across the financial markets over the past 10 years and helps them to develop their risk capability and their risk processes and improves how they manage with the psychological and emotional aspects of engaging with financial market risk. As well as working with retail clients, our clients include global hedge funds, asset management firms, investment banks, energy and commodity trading businesses. We also offer a suite of other services, including AlphaMind Mental Strength Development Coaching, which is based on programs we have delivered to senior executives at some of the world's largest corporations, as well as to traders and investment specialists. We also offer high quality executive and performance coaching programs to leaders and managers from across the financial markets and beyond. To find out more about our work, visit our partner site, alphaRcubed.com. That's the word alpha, the letter R and the word cubed.com or email info at alphaRcubed.com. Now on with the podcast. Well, welcome to uh, this week's uh, Alpha Mind podcast, and we're delighted to have Marston Parker with us. And if you'd uh, read Jack Twager's book, Unknown Market Wizards, that might just ring a bell. Uh, Marston was the only pure systematic trader that Jack had found whose performance was significantly superior than others to merit actually being included in his book. 20 years of uh, trading profile of 20% compounded return certainly startled Jack and, and amazed Jack. And I think the storyline of, of, of being a musician that then translated into being a trader is a fantastic story that we're looking to delve deeper into. So, Marston, well, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm very happy to be on. It's my first first ever podcast interview. So you have the honor of uh, maybe it won't be my last. We'll see. Well, we'll certainly uh, make it as comfortable an experience. And there's lots to talk about. I know that uh, both Steve and I have gone through the, the stories uh, that you've shared and that are available within the book. Um, and that obviously, with our own backgrounds, we can relate to a lot of it. But of course, um, your angle into trade in the market was very much around or uh, is very much around uh, that of, of the stock market, um, amongst other things. Um, but perhaps just give us a, a, a bit of a feel for you know, where it's all come from, yes, this, this storyline and the origin, uh, and just where you are now. Sure. The, the quick summary, coming out of high school, I, my two main interests were computer programming and violin playing, classical violin. Um, and I was not sure which I wanted to pursue, but ended up trying for violin. And I took a year off and did nothing but practice. And then I got into a conservatory in New York City and went there for four years and did my best to uh, become as good a violinist as I could. But it, it, it was a good way to learn that you know, I was I was never going to reach the top of the pile in the classical music world, and um, and also that was the early '80s, and it was the really the beginning of the personal computer revolution. So um, I got access to uh, to some Apple II computers, and and then got my own computer a couple of years after that, and I I just uh, couldn't resist programming. I, it, it seems to be more somehow more appealing to me even than than music in the end. So. Um, 
I decided not to pursue the, the music career. Um, I didn't have a programming degree and I didn't really, it, it wouldn't work for me to go and get another degree again. Uh, I moved back home to Boston and got a job at a computer store. And then by a series of lucky events, managed to land a job at a software startup, basically by showing them some code I had written and taking a very low salary. And um, that ended up, you know, working working out well. I, I did well at that. I learned, got mentored by some really good programmers and learned how to do it right. And um, two jobs, uh, two companies later, uh, ended up starting a company with a few other people in, in the space of automated software testing tools. Um, that coincidentally, the the chairman and largest investor was Jim Simons, which is back in the early 90s when he was doing some venture capital. We were one of the companies he invested in. And then um, we went public in 96. Uh, and, and I had, I think I owned what, roughly 4% of the company. So I had some stock and um, it wasn't a huge IPO. And that like we probably couldn't have gone public many, many other times, but it, basically in the late 90s, anybody could go public. And then, um, yeah, so, so just watching our stock every day, and plus realizing I was going to have some money to invest, it just got me interested in the stock market. I started buying books about investing and, and noticed there were also some books about trading. I, did, I didn't even know people did short-term trading, but those seemed to interest me a little more. And I ended up opening a brokerage account and um, started dabbling in, in trading and made all the usual rookie mistakes and lost some money, but I wasn't doing anything too huge. And I was getting tired of my job at that point. You know, once a company's public, it becomes more about making the numbers every quarter and it was getting a little less creative. And um, so I, I decided just kind of as an experiment, you know, let's just take a little time off from after 13 years of intensive software industry work and try trading full time and see what happens. Um, and a after that, that first year when I lost some money, but mostly I was still working, um, I got in, got connected with somebody who was doing systematic trading already or semi-systematic, a guy named Gary B. Smith. He was writing a column for thestreet.com and that appealed to me. And I had also recently read the William O'Neill book. So I was kind of in that direction in my thinking and ended up just emailing with Gary a lot and um, adopting his methods and working with him. Uh, we became kind of trading partners and um, had a very good year in 1998 and and just continued to I, I gradually wrote software to test the kind of approach we were using and evolved it towards mechanical and I became completely mechanical or systematic at the start of 2000 and remained that way ever since and had I had no losing years from from 1998 until through 2012 yeah, I averaged 27% a year with 20% as my maximum drawdown and no losing years. Um, so that, you know, I was making more than I had in, in, in my career. So um, although still not enough, you know, so you use the term compounded and, and um, the problem with when you quit your job and, and just trade full time, you don't actually really compound your money because you end up withdrawing it for living expenses. And of course, the tax bill every quarter is fairly significant, especially when you're doing well. Uh, so, you know, but I was making more than I was spending and it was all working fine. And I hit a bit of a rough patch and now I've come out of that and I'm doing better again. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. It's interesting because I think you're kind of, in a way, living the dream, which a lot of people who will be listening to this podcast are having, which is that idea that they could become self-sufficient as a trader, make a living out of it, and, and do it so that they're independent. Yeah, I mean, w when I when I was at the, at the bottom of my worst period a few years ago, um, I had some times when I really regretted abandoning my career and thought, you know, because I did actually go back and try to, reconnect with some former colleagues and see if I could get reemployed. But you know, nobody really wanted to hire a guy who was approaching 60 and hadn't worked in 20 years, despite my former excellent track record as a software developer. So so in that sense, uh, you know, there, there was a certain risk. But despite that, um, I'd probably do it the same way if I did it again. Uh, you know, Jack particularly liked that aspect of the story and wanted to go with that chapter title of don't quit your day job. But, you know, it, I mean, I've had, I, I like having freedom of my time. Like I don't keep a calendar. I like having nothing scheduled. I mean, of course, occasionally something like this podcast comes up and I'll, I'll observe the schedule, but <laughs> you know, I mean, as a, as a, on average, more often than not, I don't have a schedule. I can, I can do what I want. And, and, um, you know, I've been able to spend 
a lot more time with my family than I would have if I had still worked full time over the past 20 years and devote more time to violin playing, which I could still do and, and enjoy. Um, you know, I was it improved my level enough so that I could could become concert master of the orchestra that I play in. And so that was a nice thing. So, so yeah, but, but, you know, I have to point out, unlike some of the other people in the book, I didn't start with a tiny amount and then have tremendous trading results and leverage it. I mean, I, I started with more than enough capital, you know, and, and traded it well enough to not lose it all. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I suppose that's, I mean, one, one of the great things about the book is that, it, and it's the same with all the books, actually, in this series, The Market Wizards. I mean, there must have been, you know, 60 odd traders now, 70 odd traders have been interviewed. And every single one of their stories is different. Every single one of them started differently. Um, and I suppose you don't choose where you start. But to a degree, there's, there is an element of choice of how you get there, get to the destiny in the end. You know, you, 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 you were fortunate that you had that start. But do, do you think you'd have done well anyway? Or is that just something you've never pondered? I've, it's really hard to ponder that. Uh, I don't know if I would have even gotten interested in trading if I hadn't been been in a situation where my company went public and I, I ended up owning stock. Um, I mean, in a way, you know, actually, I really, my best investment ever was was accepting um, stock in Segway when my little consulting company merged with them in exchange, you know, with a par value of 50 cents a share or something in exchange for our technology. Um, Because that ended up being the huge capital gain when we went public. Um, If you go back to that time, you you said you've made, you made rookie mistakes when you started trading and you made rookie mistakes when you started uh, first creating the system. Perhaps can you can you describe something because I think everyone does because by nature everyone who starts somewhere is a rookie at the of very course. beginning. Well, I mean the the the, the biggest the, the first big mistake that I really remember. I mean, I was just kind of trying I, 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 trying to figure out you know how to decide when to buy a stock or when to sell a stock or or even just or even more broadly how to decide how to invest my money. And I met you know I I did a bunch of reading I th- and I looked at. You know, value line. I don't know. I read. I, I kept buying books and reading them. I became an expert in investing books at some point. But um, like, yeah, I think your local porters. Yeah, shop, that's, that's right. Well, that that's cool? right. The, <laughs> yeah, some of them are. I've done a lot of pruning, but some of them are still on the bookshelf that you can see behind my head here. Yeah, you know, I I think from the very beginning I was interested in just using finding some kind of metrics. You know, and I I learned about you know PE ratios and. Um, and then I came across this, this idea of PE ratio divided by growth rate, the PEG ratio. And I, so I thought, oh, okay, let's try ranking stocks on that. And I think my, the very first stock I ever bought was um, Bank of Boston or Bank, yeah, Bank of Boston, which ended up merging with something else. But um, yeah, State right, Street. right. So then um, you know, I actually have a spreadsheet with all with those first trades. And, and I tried to record the reason for some of them, and they were, you know, they were slightly different. You know, I, I did, I think what many people starting out do is after one loss, I would say, okay, that doesn't work. Let's try something different. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, and I, th- of course, I was uh, watching, that, that was kind of the, the early days of CNBC when it was a little bit better than it is now, I would say. Um, and I also <laughs> used to like, um, Oh, that show on NPR, I think it was called Nightly Business Report. I can't remember. Paul Kangas. Yeah, Paul Kangas, Nightly Business Report. Because it was, it, ha- it had some parts about trading in it. I-, I always gravitated toward, you know, the investment type shows. If there was something more about short term tactics, that was much more interesting to me. So I, just from the very beginning, I couldn't grasp the idea of buy and hold investing at all. Uh, you know, I tried. I also did try consulting with a financial planner and s- seeing what he wanted to sell me. And it, it's basically a you know buy and hold approach. The market's going to go up 11 percent every year, so just put your money in it. Uh, you'll only have to pay us two percent, you know, and we'll put your money in mutual funds that also have a two percent fee. But after that, you get to keep the rest. I don't know. It didn't appeal to me to do it that way, so I wanted to do it myself. Um, but the big, the first big mistake I made was. I was watching CNBC one morning and, and 
they were going on and on about what a great earnings uh, this company, uh, Miller Herman, Herman Miller, whatever it is, MLHR, they make office chairs and things like that, uh, how, how they had crushed their earnings and uh, the stock was up big. And so I thought, oh, I better buy that. So I, I took a probably by far the largest position I had ever taken. Uh, and it was, you know, classic to uh, sell the news scenario where, where uh, it had already been running up, but I didn't know that. All I knew is they said it was good on CNBC. <laughs> so I put on a big position, you know, and that, so that was my first experience of um, fairly quickly getting into a loss and then adding to the position because I, you know, the earnings were good. They must be rebound soon. So, and, I, and, you know, losing sleep for a few nights. And um, so I had that had that one big loss, you know, and to some, I, I don't, I think I lost maybe 20 grand or so on that trade. And, to, you know, to some people starting out with a 25 grand account, that would have been horrible. But, you know, I, I had a million dollars in, in a brokerage account, so it wasn't that big a deal. But, um, but still, uh, it, you know, it, it inflicted a level of pain on me that I didn't want to repeat. So, so that was a good, good sort of early lesson. And, in, in not just trading ad hoc or following my intuition or whatever. Um, so I, it, it, that steered me towards saying I want some kind of a system or at least a set of rules that I can follow. Um, and I just kept reading and, uh, you know, online and books and happened to uh, any, any, any book or, or, or website where somebody was, the, the clearer the rules were, uh, the, the more appealing it was to me. Uh, so, so this Gary Smith's columns, uh, you know, he, he was a good writer and he would just describe his approach and it seems simple. I, I also have a big bias towards anything that's simple. Um, so. Well, that's, that's one of the basic rules that they often talk about with trading is keep it yeah, simple. Yeah. So many people try to overcomplicate. Yeah, which I ended up doing. I, <laughs> I, I, once I got into <laughs> systematic backtesting, you know, I was like, oh, let's add another parameter. Let's add another parameter. Uh, you know, you end up going through the, you, through your trades. You have one losing trade, so you try to find a new rule that would have prevented that trade and add it to the system and so on, and you end up with way too many rules. Um, it's uh, it's very interesting uh, your journey. I remember when my auntie Enid, who was a bit of an opera singer and a mu and a music teacher herself, she said that if you if if, if you can learn music and if you learn could learn learn to play an instrument, you learn all about what commitment means. You learn all about what practice make perfect means, and you start to have a sixth sense um, about things. You have a different type of language. Um, and I sort of have seen several sort of what I'd call almost masters of the universe type traders that I've come across that actually have got um, a bit of a musical background. They sort of, they, they chill out to guitar playing or they, um, you know, they've got something going on with music. And certainly there, there is some overlap with the way that you've come into trading. You know, the, the idea that you've almost wanted to follow a hymn sheet of, 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 uh, of guidance and, and the code writing. Um, and I think there's, there's parallels. It's almost like you're following your, your musical purpose through the device that is trading. Um, and, and, and certainly what I picked up from, from, from reading your piece, I think that's a real benefit to have that type of background. I expect so. Yeah. I mean, certainly a lot has been written about, about, you know, the benefits of studying an instrument for, to children, um, throughout, throughout your life. Um, you know, um, when, and, and also the, the, the process I went through when I, in my teen years, got very committed to violin, I just had sort of taken lessons and done it in school without any seriousness until I was 13. And then I suddenly, I started listening to a lot of classical music and this light bulb went off of, oh, maybe I can actually play this music that I love so much. And, um, and then I got very serious and just practiced hours a day. And when you, when you, reach that level of saying, I really want to be able to do this well, and then go through this repeated frustration of, oh my God, I'm not very good yet, am I? Uh, and how can I improve that? And you get into that that loop or the cycle of, um, of you know, practice and like re re experimentation and self-examination. This is kind of a feedback, self-critical feedback loop that hopefully spirals upwards and not downwards. 
And um, whatever it, whatever field it is, it, it, going through that process helps with whatever other things in life you do as well. Can, can I ask you something? Because you 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 became, I suppose, almost unwittingly a, a, a significant shareholder in a company. And did, what did you learn from that? I mean, the company was IPO'd. You never, I suppose, you'd never been involved in stocks or shares at that point. Although I saw your your father and grandfather from the markets, so there was a there was an ancestral. There lineage. was in a way, yeah. And, and although I I think I I, I probably uh, pushed back against that in my in my teen years. You know, I just saw, especially in my late teens, I just wanted to be an artist. You know, I saw myself as an artist, not as a uh, a finance person, certainly. Um, uh, but but yeah, my grandfather was was a Wall Street banker of some kind. I don't know. I think he was in international banking. Uh, worked for Manufacturers Hanover Trust. Um, yeah, and and then my my father was an economist. He he was uh, into econometrics and uh, you know macroeconomic modeling and so on. Ended up. Uh, teaching and at the University of Illinois. And, um, so there's some of that, you know, I guess I have some some math aptitude that came from from him or something. Um, although I don't really never end up used a lot of math in trading. The, the things you really need in in markets, are, I mean, just right, you need to be able to kind of think in ratios and percents and, and ideally know a little bit about probability, which very few people get taught anything about me. Yeah. I always try and advise my clients to listen to the work of, or to read, of course you listen these days as well, to the work of Nassim right. Taleb. I mean, I, I always think the book Fooled by Randomness should be essential reading for any trader. Oh, I agree. I read that uh, when it first came out and it, it definitely had an impact on me. Yeah, I, th I think you will be a better trader if you read that. And also the work of Annie Duke, who was our guest, guest a couple of weeks ago. Yes. And there's a few other people, decision-making, thinking in terms of probabilities, risk, that sort of thing. Um, but I, I, I wanted to ask you about what, what you learned from being a shareholder in the company, because you then you kind of followed the progress of the company, the share price. Right, right. I mean, I mean certain, probably I would say the first lessons I learned were emotional. You know, just seeing uh, I had some kind of little handheld device where I could where I could get the the, the latest price and, and it would calculate my, the, the, the value of all the shares I owned. And I would keep glancing at that during the day and seeing the changes in that number were, were really shocking. You know, I would see the value going up and down by more than I made in a year, which was kind of strange. Um, also, you know, watching it, it be, like most IPOs, there was a, a clause that the, um, the, the people who worked for the company couldn't sell their stock for, I think it was six months, uh, the lockout period. Um, and, you know, and so, so watching the value, and, and I just, I wanted to take the money and run. I mean, I wanted to diversify as soon as I could. Um, and not like one of these founders who has so much faith in my business that I would never want to put my stock in anything else. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm always aware in anything of kind of how much luck and randomness is involved. But um, so watching the, the value, at some point, the value of my stock went up to over five million and, it, and I couldn't do anything about it. Yeah. And then uh, we missed a, missed earnings the second quarter after the IPO and the, the thing plunged. I mean, I, I still did well enough, but that was quite a roller coaster. But I also learned I, I, I had... Um, I don't remember exactly. There was some, I think it was some way even on the internet, which was very young then, uh, where you could find the intraday prices of things. So I would, I would look at our at our stock, or and I think I even somehow I subscribed to a real time data feed or something when I in probably in early '97 when I was starting to dabble. I don't remember what kind of feed it would have been, but because I remember watching the actual thing and noticing that it, it hardly ever traded. It would only trade a few times a day sometimes. And I thought, well, that's strange. Um, so that was something. It, it, it really, I mean, I, I, I just learned what a stock is. Uh, there's, no, there's, yeah. there's no way to learn what a stock is until you actually buy one and then watch it, watch it trade. Um, and so that's how that happened for me. That, that must be quite a, quite a a hardship you know one, one, one day you're worth six million and yeah you never have to work again 
a couple of weeks later you're worth one million and like oh God, okay yeah <laughs> I mean, you can't do anything about it. Right. I mean, still, still, I knew how much better off I was than I had been. So, um, yeah, I but, suppose so. But yeah, that yeah, that, that took some adjustment, and it it took some. It, it was strange to get a windfall. I mean, I, I've read about this too. Like people who win the lottery or so on are often have trouble adjusting to it. And and in my case, it was a very modest windfall compared to what some of these Silicon Valley people end up doing. But. Um, but still, it was it was a psychological adjustment to suddenly say, "Oh, okay, I can pay off my mortgage. I, I have all these options I didn't used to have." Um, yeah, you know, I, I felt some strength, like some guilt about it somehow too. And and do you, do you think what you learned from being a Stockholm? I mean, because that must be you know, it's like you can read a thousand books, but just one day holding a share can teach you more than those thousand books and you're getting that every single time right and plus you know the other interesting aspect is it forced me to do what no investor should ever do which is to to have like you know 98 percent of my net worth in one stock and and you, and you said also there was a great comment talking on this idea of books that one of your colleagues has said that you must be an expert on trading with all the time you spent reading trading books and you said no i'm only an expert on trading books. <laughs> Yeah, that guy has been yeah. telling that joke ever since. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that that does talk about that because it, there is that, you know, you, you can learn on a simulator, you can run theoretical programs, you can read books, but until you actually get your feet wet and you start to drown a few times, you don't really learn this job. Yeah, I guess it's to my credit that I knew that. I mean, even before I had done much trading, I knew that I didn't know what I was doing. Um, you know, and I, so I dabbled a little and lost some money, but again, with a very small position size relative to my capital. So, um, yeah, you know, I was, I was pretty conservative from the start and really always have been. We hope you're enjoying this podcast. Just a chance to quickly tell you about our podcast partner, the Society of Technical Analysts. The Society of Technical Analysts, the STA, are the world's oldest body for the advancement of uh, technical analysis and price action, education, research and knowledge. They provide outstanding services for their members, including top quality education programs. And as a not-for-profit body, they are not there to rip you off, just provide outstanding insights and learning. So, please do check out the STA. Their website is sta-uk.org. Now back to the podcast. Going, going back on this, this trading journey, I think, you know, for you to suddenly be recognized by, by, by Jack and all the people that you've seen as, as being like the only pure, I mean, I guess he's defined you as this, um, you know, you know the unbelievable performance uh, trader in the way that you've traded. But of course, I think all that, came about because you understood code you know you understood how to create the code and the program and build them uh, and build the infrastructure that that gave you the signals that gave you the you know, the metrics to be able to trade um and of course we're now in an environment where you know gamification is being spoken about and there's going to be a lot of people listening to this type of uh, podcast Trying to get a sense as to you know what what their niche is. I mean, how do they get get into um, you know trading the market rather than perhaps just you know black or black or red or you know, flipping a coin? But I mean, I think your your, your evidence that um, actually having a commitment to you know something like the code that's that, that builds these uh, these systems and then knowing the market through that journey as well. That's that's quite a unique skill because you hear so much about you know people in in businesses where you know they outsource the code to the IT team and what comes back is not what they what they desired and sitting within the code somewhere are these Easter eggs that pop up and you know pop pop up badly at the wrong times, but that that journey is quite important, would you not say? Yeah, I, I mean it depends on the person, but. Um... It's hard for me to imagine being a, a fully systematic trader and using, you know, code that other people wrote that I don't even understand what it's doing. Mm -hmm. um, although, I mean, I don't know, there's a lot of good tools available now. So, you know, I may well have uh, just used one if I could have. When when I first got interested in doing portfolio level backtesting, I literally couldn't find any software that could do it. Uh, you know, back 
back in 98. Um, there probably was some, but it was, it was too expensive or whatever, but you know, pretty much the, like there was, I think there was trade station, but you, you really could only test one symbol at a time. Um, and, and so, and, and from the beginning, I, I, I had an instinct to that. It didn't make sense to develop a system for one symbol that, it, that I wanted to, I, I basically wanted to have a trading process, uh, uh, you know, scan the market for, for, for different stocks each day that meet some criteria and, and take position and rank them some way and take positions in some of them and have some exit rules. And then I wanted to be able to test that entire process to know how it would have worked in the past. So, so my software evolved uh, towards being able to do that. Um, and yeah, I think it's, I think it's key to be able to, you either have to build the software yourself or you have to really become a, you know, a power user of the software that you're using so that, that you fully understand how it works and you know how to look under the hood and you just have to have confidence that, that the, the model is doing what you think it's doing before you invest money in it. Yeah. And would you say that that became certainly, uh, a good part of your edge was actually having that level of interaction with the market through your self-written software. I think so. I mean, I've, I've always, I've always had a very small edge, uh, in, in the systems that I've run. Um, I think the main reason I, I've even, you know, been successful is be, is that it just because of being systematic that I, you know, if you, even if you have a very small edge, if you just keep repeating it over and over, you're still making making a profit. And um, and I am not not 100 consistent. I mean, I've interfered with my systems, you know, too often and changed them at the wrong time and so on, like anyone else does. But um, it's all averaged out to being being sort of good enough. I mean, the downside of being a software developer for me is that there have been many times when rather than learning more about the markets or trying different systems, I'd rather keep improving my backtesting software because that's actually more fun for me. Like working on the code itself is more fun than researching trading ideas. I actually don't even like trading that much, but <laughs> I mean, I'm really- uh, I'm, You've come up, can I use that as the introduction? <laughs> I, don't no, even yeah. like I mean, I'm, I'm grateful for it. Yeah. Uh, but does that is that is that really it then i mean you, you, your passion is computer software and it is and, yeah. and what you're doing is you're living with your passion and it's giving you a chance to earn an income and freedom and in, independence right right yeah programming and playing violin are my two things and and, uh, and the you know, whatever it takes <laughs> yeah whatever it takes to be able to to do those and and to do them both you know, without a boss. I mean, I'm also grateful that I'm not a professional musician. Well, especially now, because so many of, the, of them are, are struggling with COVID. But, um, you know, the, the professional orchestra musicians have to play a lot of times, you know, the same music over and over or, or like play holiday pops every year when they'd rather be playing Shostakovich or, um, you know, play recently written pieces that aren't necessarily that good or whatever. Um, you know, I, I like I get to play whatever I want, uh, whenever I want, and same with with coding. But I I do really enjoy working on software and having other people use it as well. Yeah, that, yeah. you know, it's it's a really interesting thing because, um, like you say, you, your passion was software, building software, designing software, and, and making it better. And your passion wasn't trading. Now, we could joke about that, but so many people I've met who are very successful have told me that their passion wasn't money, but it was some aspect of the trading. It was the puzzle or it was the right. being engaged in something that's the center of the world. That everything revolves around or, or just, you know, sort of the, the, just being in something that is such a, a big part of the world. You know, when everything's crashing, the news stories are all about markets, that that almost made it more interesting for them and what motivated them. It wasn't just for the money. I know there are some, and some went into it for the money, but they found their passion because of some other aspect. I think, yeah, I think that I've seen that pattern as well. And I think it's cycle, if, if all you, if all you're doing is looking at your, uh, your account balance every minute and trying to cause it to go up, I mean, I think that's psychologically the hardest 
possible way to approach it. I mean, it's really much better if you find some process that interests you and focus on that, and then it happens to result in the, the right direction of the account balance. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but also, I mean, I've I've never had an ambition to be ultra wealthy. You know, yeah. I just I just want to have a little more than I need so that I don't have to worry about money and 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 then be happy within that. So, so but if if we just sort of change the subject slightly. We've got an audience listening today of, I should imagine that, that, you know, that they're people who are curious about trading, curious about how they can improve their trading, improve their processes. What would be, uh, you know, for someone who wants to get into trading, what would be your advice based on your experience? Um, I guess it depends on the kind of person, but it, 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 I, you know, if, if you're, well, actually, no matter what kind of person you are, I guess, my advice, the, the number one advice is to find someone you can connect with who's already doing the kind of thing, the kind of thing you think you want to do. Um, and, uh, and just, you know, gradually develop a relationship with them. That's, that's exactly what I did with Gary B. Smith. I, I um, you know, I read here and read books, read articles until I found something that, that kind of clicked with me. It's like, oh, I can see myself doing that approach. And then I started, I just wrote him an email and he, re, he replied. So I wrote back again and he replied again and uh, just built up a relationship. Um, I didn't have a goal of, um, you know, like, oh, I want to find someone to mentor me. It just kind of evolved. Yeah. Um, but, but uh, you know, in hindsight, that, that was probably the most helpful thing. Because otherwise, if you, you got to find someone who is already succeeding to some degree and then otherwise you'll, you'll just there's you'll just try something and then the moment you have one or two losing trades you'll say this doesn't work and then that, that's what i see a lot with with newer traders it's just switching from one thing to another after the, the first loss i mean you have to one way or another you have to get confidence that something is going to work mm. um, in order to do it long enough to see because because nothing works every trade as we all know i mean you, you, you need to you're looking for something that'll that'll work. This Nick Raj, who I've recently become friends with, has this great phrase: "Next 1,000 trades." <laughs> That's what you're looking for. You you, you want to know what how the next 1,000 trades are going to have a positive expectancy, whatever that's going to take for you. Um, so so you know whether you're discretionary or systematic, you've got to learn some kind of a method or a process that that you can repeat, and and uh, then that then have something to that'll make you stick to that and, and not uh, wander from it too much. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's interesting that when you come back to that idea about having a mentor, finding a mentor, um, it sounds like that was pivotal for you in your career. Um, yeah. And, and I think people forget, almost fail to understand this. You know, most, almost all successful traders had mentors at some point, or had several mentors. You know, I, I know the three traders in that book, um, Amrit, Dowager uh, and Richard, and there, there was more within that group. They were an amazing small group of traders that all worked together. And I think they all mentored each other slightly. They all bounced from right. each other. Um, they, they, they probably tested each other. They probably supported each other. They found things that worked. And, and you know, I, I, I had the same experiences myself when I was a trader in my career, having people that... They came in and out your life and you bounced off them. You know, you clicked with them. They tested you. Um, they brought something new and then they left and you had that to go on. Yeah. And it's the same in, in music. You know, you, if you want to learn an instrument, you go and find someone who can play it and you study with them and they, you know, they show you what they do and then you try to do it and then you cycle back around until you get better. Uh, you know, and, and I've, I also mentor people in, in systematic trading and it's, you know, when when the person has the right aptitude for it, they they can do very well with it. Yeah, you run a group. You, I, I had a quick look at it. It was remind us. Of, it, yeah, it, well, it, well, slowly, or do you want to mention the name? Oh yeah, no, it's fine. I, my the back testing software that I've been gradually evolving for twenty years or so and using is called I call it Real Test, um, and I'm I'm actually going to I think. I don't know. I've dabbled with the idea of making it a product, a commercial product, on and off for a long time, and uh, 
for some reason, I'm just always reluctant to. I, I, I'm not a sales type person. I just can't bring myself to sell anything to anybody. <laughs> but uh, but some of my friends who use it keep keep saying, you know, this is really great software, and you, you really should put it out there. So I'm I'm uh, on the verge of probably doing that. But right now, I have a yeah a group of beta testers uh, in a in a forum. Uh, who, who are who are great and, and before that I've had other people some of them I, I've been in touch with for five years or more and have been you know, using my software and uh, using strategies that are similar to mine and um, yeah you know, most of them have, have done pretty well with them do you is, is there something about is there a danger in giving a strategy out too much in your opinion well pro, I mean at some point there might be you know, I mean for for it, it always costs a little bit of something. I mean, for a while in in the early two thousands, I had I had a trading partner who, who had a similar situation to mine. He had a software IPO, sort of a windfall, and so you know we were both uh, trading fairly large positions in, in the exact same strategies. So so and, and getting some slippage on the uh, on the entries and exits. Um, you know, so having his his money in there with mine. Um, it probably cost me something in slippage, but on the other hand, it was great to have a, a, a colleague and a partner to work with instead of doing it in isolation. So, you know, some things are worth paying for. Um, but yeah, I mean, at some point, well, it, it, you know, it's a, it's kind of a fuzzy question. I mean, it, yeah, I suppose if I had, if I had enough followers who literally wanted to, to do exactly what I'm doing, you know, put their orders at the same prices as mine and everything else. Yeah, it, it would certainly erode my results. Um, it's very unlikely that would ever happen. I mean, what I found is that most people don't want to use your exact strategy, even if you give it to them. They they think they can make it better, and they and in some cases they can. Yeah. Um, and um, and that's good. You know, so that it, it works better when. It's trick. See, discretionary traders have an advantage because you can start these educational services and share all your rules, and there's always enough fuzziness that uh, nobody's gonna, uh, you know, get in your way, or, or maybe you can even front run them. But um, with <laughs> not saying that happens with uh, with um, discretionary. Uh, I mean, with systematic. Um, you know, it's trickier. I mean, you. You can kind of share the general concept of a system, and or, or I mean, what I've tried to do is write example strategies that that are included with my software that that show how to implement something in each kind of category or concept conceptual category. But it's not the the systems I personally run, uh, you know. Although they, I I do try to make them profitable, right, so that people have an idea of what a profitable strategy looks like. So if we, if we go back to just that question again, though, so the advice you'd give to, to people starting out, um, you, you said first is find a mentor or find some relationships or, or work with other people. Um, that, that was the first one. Right. What other advice would you give to people starting out based on your experiences? Well, it, um, it just you just have to get get in there yourself, uh, you know, get your hands dirty, so to speak. I mean, you, you have to kind of have an, a spirit of experimentation. It's like that feedback loop I was talking about with learning a musical instrument. I mean, you, you have to, you have to spend hours and hours and hours and to try something and, and see how it goes and then modify it. You know, some of that research should be done offline by which I mean, not connected to a live account. Um, and, uh, you know, and then you have to do you know, like smaller position size live trading. I mean, whether you're discretionary or or systematic, it's this feedback loop you have to get yourself into. The spirit of experimentation, where you're going to try something, see how it works. But it's tricky though because, like I said, I tend to think something doesn't work after a couple of trades, and you so so thinking about how do you how do you measure whether something works or not. Is, is, is an interesting problem just in itself um, because the markets are changing too. So I love that term spirit of experimentation. I've never heard it described like that before. I think that's important. Yeah. I, th I think I use that. I think Jack asked me for like, what, what advice do you give? And I think I had some line about that in the, in the book. Um, but yeah, it, I, when I, when I reflect on what, why I think I've succeeded. I, I think that's a big element of it. 
you know, I, I don't, I don't assume I know anything. I just, you know, it's like if I have an idea about what might work in the market, it's just, okay, well, let's try. How can I, how can I test it? That's always my question. How can I test it? So it's kind of built upon a curiosity. For sure. Yeah. The curiosity is, um, yeah, if you have no curiosity, you'll, you'll never try anything different. And, and, and there's an example of that you, you, you repeated um in in the story you told me where you said um there's a great example of this where you said you're you're gary when you were working with gary in the early days he, yeah. he didn't like to buy at the top of a v pattern um but you did back testing you found it to be a great indicator well all right he 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 had that as a kind of a visual yeah criterion that he used so you know if you looked at the chart and saw you know, his number one rule was that was he only wanted to buy stocks that were breaking out to new highs. But but then what came before that was important, too. So if he looked at that chart and saw a V preceding the breakout to the new high, he didn't want to buy it, which it makes total sense. It means it's short term overbought, even though it's just broken out to a new high. So the breakout might be more likely to fail. Uh, but it's, I, I got to the point where these kind of qualitative visual things uh, felt too arbitrary to me and I wanted to, to think of a way to measure it. So I thought, okay, well, um, just pick a look back period and find the lowest close in that period and say it can't have risen more than X percent from that lowest close. And that was that was the indicator. And it, that turned out to be one of the most one of the best indicators. And it's just, it's just so simple. It's just like today's close divided by the 20 day lowest close that should be no more than 10 percent. otherwise you're not going to buy that breakout to a new high yeah it's, it's just a, it's a way to oversimplify uh the consolidation pattern that a chart trader would look for okay and you also mentioned something in the document you sent to, to us um about you said after experimenting many, many of the well-known indicators you couldn't find any that were useful oh i guess that was early on when um yeah the very first the, the, during that very first uh, year right after i opened my first brokerage account in in early 97 um and i was looking around for things yeah i i came across i think i even bought it at staples i noticed they had a a, a, a trading software called window on wall street uh and it and so i bought that and it, it connected to a, a, a data service called dial data because in those days you got on the internet through a modem, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know that, thing. Um, that was painful. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, that my my first few years of trading were, were involved in modems, um, <laughs> but um, but anyway, so you could yeah you could download the uh, daily bars for uh, probably the whole market or at least everything in a in a made in the S and P or something every night and and you could plot indicators on charts and you could even you could construct a very simple back test kind of on one one symbol at a time so i would just go through a few symbols with and i, I just started that's how i started learning about the standard technical indicators right um but and and uh, and it's funny because i remember discovering through that software the the uh that rsi you know, like when it crosses above 30, if you enter there and then exit when it crosses below 70, uh, which is really kind of a, it's like a trend following, but starting after a pullback. Uh, and that was the only thing I could find that that even had a positive result when I started during that first dabbling in technical back testing. Um, and, and most of the others didn't. So that, that's what I meant by that's, that statement. That's, that's quite interesting when you say that, because I used to have a belief that, you know, everyone used to say, look at RSI when it's oversold or overbought or divergent. But I, I found other patterns with it as well. There were trends within it that mm -hmm. break. And I also found in particular, it, I, I would look at the next one up. And it, when the next one up was breaking above 30, the next time period up, Actually, I used to find that's a really good period to buy, rather than the other way around. Mm -hmm. If to buy the right. shorter period, if the longer period was breaking, or for example, the longer period was breaking into overbought. No, that's it. Sorry, I'm getting confused. If the uh, if the longer period was breaking into overbought, and the shorter period was breaking up out of oversold, 
I actually found that coincided a lot with the start of a long-term trend when it after it based rather well, sure. the other way around. Yeah, no, that's that's a that's a pretty well-known thing. I think I think that's similar to Alexander Elder's triple screen system. You know, you want you want like a longer-term uptrend and then a short-term pullback and then an even shorter-term breakout yeah. to, to 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 start the reversal. So, um, yeah, that's that's definitely a reasonable strategy for for trend following. Okay, Mark, anything you want to bring in here? The spirit of experimentation continues to show through, right? I think, uh, yeah, having a curious mind and um, and I think listening to yourself, I think is quite important. You can be waylaid by other people's opinions and other people's views. And certainly if, you, if you're managing your own code, then continue to manage your own code is a, is a pretty safe, tra a safer trajectory. Um, but of course, you know, having this mentor, I mean, Gary, Gary B. Smith, um, who, he was, a, was he an author on the street.com? Was he one of the big? Yes. Yeah. Yes. He, he, uh, he was, uh, he had a, his column was called technicians take right. yeah, yeah, yeah. back in the nineties. And it, it was quite a good column. Uh, there's a couple hundred of them, I think that he, he wrote uh, once or twice a week, maybe. Yeah, and, go, and going back to that conversation. Was, was it his sense of technicals that blended in with your code that was, was the... Well, I hadn't even written any code related to trading yet. At the time right. I was reading that column, I was still working at Segway and I was, um, you know, starting to dabble in just how to invest and putting on some positions based on whatever. And then, um, and looking for, I think I was really looking for a, a method, like an investing method that I could use. And, and his, it, it wasn't so much that, that he was describing all kinds of technical indicators. In fact, his, his method didn't use any standard indicators. It was just very simple, uh, based on simple chart patterns and breakouts. Uh, and, and he always, he talked about having a really a mechanical exit strategy. He would literally get, get in a position and then put a target and a stop and whichever one hit first, that was it. And that was, that was it. There was no more position management after that. Um, and, um, so, so, you know, he, he clearly was making money with it and, and it was a, a simple method and he was able to just follow us, do the same thing every day. And that, that really appealed to me. So it was the fact that he was, he was doing that. It was more that he was process oriented than, than anything about technical analysis. It's tremendous. I think it's, it's, it's so interesting how you've, you've been on this purposeful direction, which is probably music. But you've re-engineered it to be a purposeful direction within within coding and and, and uh, software writing, and by almost accident, you've just become this very very profitable trader as a consequence. But you know you're still, but it's the money is money is not the driver. It's the creativity and experimentation around the code that's the driver. Yeah, I think that's about right. Um, yeah, I got into trading it. It kind of is an experiment. I, th I thought, well, I can always go back to the software industry, um, you know, which would have been true for at least the first five years, but, but I did well too soon. Um, <laughs> so, so that, uh, the window of opportunity for going back kind of closed up. Um, but, but yeah, I, ne I never kind of, I never had a big plan of, Oh, I'm going to become a trader or I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. I, partly that's just my personality. I'm, I'm much, I'm more present centered. I'm not kind of a, I don't tend to have a long-term goal and be driving towards it. I, I just, my favorite question is what's next? Yeah. So I guess, um, what did Gary learn from you though? Well, he, he actually, uh, became more, uh, more systematic in his own approach as well. Yeah. I mean, uh, so we found a good, a good kind of common ground, you know, he, he ended up, um, uh, his next step after those street.com days was starting a, a newsletter service, which he used to call the chart man. And he had quite a lot of subscribers. He would basically send out, he would basically do what it, what he always did, which is looking at a lot of charts every evening and see and picking the few that he thought looked best and just send those to all his, his people say, yeah, buy this and tomorrow's open and put these exits. And, um, you know, that, that kind of approach could work, uh, pretty well in the late nineties like any other kind of approach. Mm -hmm. And um, so, um, but, but uh, after that, he, he, he got more and more into, um, into systematic 
work. You know, we kept in touch and he kept using my software and uh, got into system trading himself in, in some ways. And for you, Marston, what's next? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, keep, keep, keep doing what I'm doing. Uh, uh, taking, I'm, I'm, I'm really been putting most of my energy over the past year or so into, into my software, trying to re just get it to a level where it's really, um, generally, you know, polished and, 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 well, writing documentation was a big project. Um, cause if you're going to have a lot of people using your software, you definitely want to document it. And, um, you know, it, it does have some unique, unique capabilities that, that other trading modeling software doesn't. So I'm, I want to find find the best way to make it available to other people and, and help other people use it and, and learn to do what I'm doing when they're interested. Uh, and, you know, keep working on my strategies and try to keep earning a living from this. And what, what are those, 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 those aspects of it that are unique then that are different that you said it has? Um, it, the, the main thing is, is, I mean, I don't know if, if it's completely unique, I'm sure there's other things you can do it, but being able to uh, not only test a portfolio of symbols, but also a portfolio of strategies. Right, okay. In the same script. And being able to, to set that all up fairly easily with, with uh, you know, fairly straightforward scripting code. I mean, it's not really a, a programming language that it has. It's It's really a it's just a general purpose uh, multi-strategy trading system model with a lot of parameters, which which you specify as as formulas, sort of like one line callback functions. Um, and uh, and then there's a place where you can you can build data arrays for all the indicators you want and so on. And um, but yeah, it just it I think I I've, I've been able to make complex portfolio. Uh, technical system trading a little more accessible than any other software has. I wish I had that 25 years ago when I was a young trader starting. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to do it on spreadsheets and it was so long. Yeah, yeah. That, that was my limit. <laughs> right. But um, okay, well, listen, this has been great. I, I, I've got one last question, which I just want to ask before we kind of wrap it up. Sure. Was there ever any issues with trying to perfect systems because this is one of the problems that i meet with people quite often i would say yeah i mean i've i've met some people who who, who never start trading a system because it's it's not good enough yet and I've, I've never had that particular issue i mean i kind of want to dive in and experiment and get my feet wet and see how things work but i i think i did have a misunderstanding for for a few years that that uh you know to well, yeah, I, I didn't really struggle with that issue. I mean, I, I did tend to just stick to one system and whenever it got into a drawdown, I would, I would try to find a way to improve it so that it wouldn't have had that drawdown. Uh, and, and I was content to keep doing that as long as it seemed to work. Uh, but I, I've now come to understand that it's, it actually is better to, um, to just combine a lot of different simple systems, uh, and don't even, and you don't even have to have to really uh, refine each one that much. I mean, it's if 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 you can find four or six or eight strategies that are all that are each profitable, you know, modestly profitable, um, but and do well at different times, uh, and then put them together, you you end up with a really nice combined result, uh, and. Um, Part of the reason I never really figured that out is because I never had software that could do it. Because even until about two years ago, all the old versions of my own software only could test, you know, two system, one long and one short. It was like, yeah. I really call it the long side and the short side of the same system. And other, uh, a lot of other backtesting software works that way as well. You can either, even if it has a portfolio level thing, you really only have one long strategy and one short strategy. And then, if, you know, of course you can have different ones and then export them and go into Excel and combine them or whatever. But at some point, if the process is too tedious, I lose attention and won't keep doing it. So it's, yeah, yeah. It's better when it's in the same software. So that, that Mark, Mark's going to sum up in a minute, but I, I love that thing, which you've mentioned a few times of, of getting your feet wet. 
you know, it, it just feels so in that spirit of experimentation of, you know, rather than trying to perfect it, you know, you just have to try it sometimes and you have to get your feet wet. It's, it's a balance. Balance is a word I use a lot too, but cause yeah, you, you know, you, you can't just sit there staring at the water, but you don't want to just jump in cause it might be ice cold. So, you know, but yeah, experiment, reiterate. Balance, balance experiment, reiterate. That's terrific. Mark, any final thoughts? Well, listen, I think, Marston, it's just been a fascinating discussion just, just through the journey with some sound bites that we didn't expect in the middle. But, uh, <laughs> and I think, um, you know, it, sometimes things just happen, don't they? I think you, just, you, you find a niche, you exploit it to the point of for your own personal satisfaction, and you suddenly find these other benefits from you know, the background of having this purpose that, was driven by the commitment required for music and the experimentation of that, and guess how that translated. Um, but of course, if, if the audience want to read more about you, then of course, Jack Swager's book, Unknown Market Wizards, has a whole chapter about you, which is thoroughly interesting with some of Jack's own views about that. And, the, and in that book, um, I think Jack ends up with a bit, of, a bit of a summary, and that summary is, don't quit your day job. Uh, appreciate randomness, test everything. There's a little bit of stuff about not listening to anybody else, but of course having a mentor is pretty important. Um, but having this spirit of experimentation and curiosity, um, you don't know what you'll find when you look close enough, and I think uh, you're proof of that. So we, we wish you well with um, all these various things you've got going on and you know, bring, bring in code to market potentially at some point to the benefit of all. But um, Steve and I thank you so much. Steve, any final word from you? Yeah, just just quickly, Marston, anywhere where people can find out more about you. Sure, yeah, I mean, I, I really am uh, living up to the title of the book in that I, I've, I've kind of stayed unknown. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I've never really had much of a website or a social media presence, but I, since um, I kind of, I, once the, um, preview pages of the book appeared on, on Amazon and Google so that it became public knowledge that I was in it. I said, okay, I'm going to just get ahead of the curve and try to start creating something. So I joined Twitter. And so you can follow me on Twitter, Marston P, M-A-R-S one zero P. Um, and I have a website, mhptrading.com, which right now is really a one simplistic static page about real test. Uh, but I'm going to probably expand it, maybe even start blogging. Okay. I'm, I'm, uh, I don't know. I've had, have had, had anxiety about public exposure for most of my life, but I'm kind of getting over it now. So. <laughs> Terrific. And one final thought. Have you been back to that Borders yet and stood there and just read about you? <laughs> Sadly, Borders is no longer in business. All right. Okay. Oh, no. All right. <laughs> but, so no. Maybe a local bookshop. Um, well, it's funny that our local Barnes and Noble doesn't seem to carry uh, this, this book for some reason. But uh. yeah, I can see you sitting on this desk with a stack of books and just signing them for people, you know. <laughs> no, listen, this has been a real pleasure. I've really enjoyed talking to you, Mustard. And I, I, oh, I've enjoyed it too. Thank you. It's great. Okay, lovely. Well, um, and it, well, that's it, I suppose. Really, um, that's it. it. Thank you so much for 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 having me on and giving my, my, me my first podcast opportunity. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you for listening today. And thank you to our podcast partner, the Society of Technical Analysts, the STA. Again, you can find out more about their excellent services, education programs, and courses by visiting sta-uk.org. If you have enjoyed this podcast, please feel free to rate us and review us on iTunes, Spotify, or whichever service you've used. More ratings and reviews helps other people find out about the Alpha Mind podcast. You can also connect with us or follow us on social media at AlphaMind101 is one of our Twitter handles and at AlphaMind102 is the other one. You can also view our blog page, alphamindblog.blogspot.com where we have lots of articles, information about the podcasts, and pages of books and other podcasts which we highly recommend finally if you want to know more about us and our services please go onto our webpage alpha-mind.net 
or go to our individual pages, alphaarcube.com and markrandallconsultancy.com. That just leaves us to say have a great week and we look forward to you joining us for future podcasts. Thank you very much.